Hymn number 48, number 48. Number 62, number 62.
Thanks for coming to Salem night. It's great to see a big group of people here. Excited to hear the testimony tonight. And this is something that is, we just had a testimony this past weekend. It's just good to remember why we believe what we believe. It's not a lot of time that I ask myself, why did I come to Wednesday night church? Or why am I a Christian? And just like we heard this past weekend, it's really encouraging to hear these testimonies. So really excited. I didn't know Elizabeth at all. And so we got together. Wayne and Nancy were part of the story in CVE. That's where they got to meet Elizabeth. So we got together on a Zoom just to listen to her story and get to hear that. So I didn't know anything. It's really, it's great to get to know our church in this way too. So it's a good way to get to know each other and then be able to see um, how we can encourage each other. So I'll say a quick prayer for us, and then Elizabeth is going to share her story. So, dear God, thank you for bringing us here. I pray that you would encourage our hearts um, with your word. We pray that the glory would go to you and not to us. We pray that um, Elizabeth and her story would uh, lead us to the cross and uh, see Jesus in it and see uh, Jesus in our own stories too, God. So we pray that you would be with her. You would calm any nerves, and we pray that um, you're blessed tonight and your spirit would be with us. Pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Elizabeth, if you want to come up here. <clears throat> so yeah, if you could tell us about your story and how you came to Christ, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thank you. Um, more a scared than I thought. Um, well, my name is Elizabeth Ravy. Um, Dustin is my husband, obviously. Um, and while I was preparing to share... Uh, tonight, I want to share something that this whole time was encouraged, they encouraged me, encouraged me a lot. I'm sorry, I'm so nervous. Um, and it was a sermon that Brother Andy shared on January 10. I'm not going to say his last name because I cannot pronounce his name, but it's Brooke's husband. <laughs> and he, um, that's the husband helping me with saying it, but I can with the microphone. Um, but he was just talking about loving our enemies and uh, not seeing people as our enemies. And then I, I think at the end, Mark said that we should not see people as our enemies, but as potential children of God. And, um, and Andy said something that really st stayed with me. And he said that um, the way to love our enemies is by living a wisely life. And I think somehow I have lived a wisely life after everything. Um, so I just want to share that, that his sermon really encouraged me a lot while I was preparing for tonight. Um, so my name is Elizabeth. Um, I am the oldest of eight daughters. My mom always wanted a son. She never got it. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, she and my dad, my, my dad met when she was almost 15 and he was 27, but told her he was 20. Um, and he was highly involved in the drug business. He worked for the local drug dealers. Um, I'm sorry if I, if I speak too fast. When I get very nervous, I start speaking and speaking, and I don't know what I'm saying. Um, and because of his job, um, he obviously owned money and things like that. Uh, and at some point, according to my mom, he owned a lot of money to a high-up drug dealer. Uh, so he sold my mom for one night, and she was raped before 15 or when she was 50 years old, I think. And nine months later, I was born. Um, so I don't know if my dad is my dad or if this guy is my dad, and I don't care <laughs> anymore. Um, and so they had six daughters, um, and we always were moving a lot for different places because obviously he couldn't stay in one place uh, because he had a lot of enemies, and we saw things that we shouldn't have seen. Um, and we ended up moving to Nogales on the Mexican side. Uh, and we moved twice, first to a nice neighborhood and then to one where um, it was just a starting. So there was a lot of violence and a lot of drugs and a lot of poor people. Um, and so it, it was really, 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 really poor. And my dad, because we were just right on the border, he was gone for weeks at the time, crossing drugs illegally here. Um, so we didn't really suffer much, but that was pretty much everyone's work to just cross drugs. Um, and well, my mom was very young um, and she got, she became very good friends with the neighbors 
next door. Um, and this guy was also very young. He had a, wa a wife and a son, and my mom was pregnant with number five. Um, so at some point, uh, he left his wife and son, and my mom tried to leave my dad for him. So two families got separated. Um, and his wife just got his kid, and she was gone. My dad did not like it. Um, he set out a fire and burned every document that proved we exist. Um, and then he got me and my sisters into our house, locked kept from outside with a chain and a lock, and throw an LP gas, like a big LP gas, on top of the roof uh, because he was going to kill us. He, was born, he wanted to burn us alive because he did not want us Go, to go with him. Um, he was okay with my mom leaving, but not his daughters. Um, but I have a sister who was a very good runner, and we had a very small window, so she managed to get out, and I don't know how far she ran, but the police came. I don't know what was happening outside. I don't know why no one could stop him from trying to burn us alive. <laughs> um, but he was taken, and um, we ended up going to our new stepfather. Um, and it was a big house with five different families, so all the, all the brothers lived there and their families. And people just came and go every day just to come and sm uh, smoke or do any type of other drugs. Um, so I don't know what you will call it, you know, it's a house full of drugs every day. Um, and um, the next part, I don't know. I don't remember the order of things. Um, I don't know what happened first or not. Um, uh, but at some point, I do remember my grandmother, my, my mom's mom, coming and taking us home, back to Magdalena. A lot, of, a lot of our family came and tried to see my mom to reason. You know, just like, you cannot live with this guy, and she did not care. Um, so, um, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, so we ended up going to Magdalena, and we were there for a few months. And life was okay. One of my sisters was in the hospital because of mal malnutrition, um, so we didn't really suffer her at all. I don't remember seeing her anyway. Uh, we went to school, and it was okay. Um, I was sexually abused by my uncle, who was in high school, while everyone was gone. It's very normal in Mexico to leave your kids alone while parents go to work. So we were always alone. Um, uh, but that part, because I was maybe like five or under, I don't, I pretty much blocked that memory of my mind until I, until I moved here and I remember. Um, but my mom, at some point, she just decided she couldn't live without her new partner, so she put us on a bus and we went back to Nogales. And um, life was okay with him. He, he, was, he seemed to be good until one morning, uh, I think almost every bad thing that happened to me, it was during the summer. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> but I was just one morning, uh, my mom was gone. Almost, yeah, they, they, they went to do something, and I was laying on, on the bed, and I remember it was the sun just coming through the window. It just seemed like a very sunny day outside. And I was just laying on the bed, sitting on the bed, I'm sorry, sitting on the bed, and I was wearing a dress with dark skirt with daisies all over the place. And next thing I know, he's on top of me. And I tried to scream, and he told me that, he, that it didn't matter how much I screamed because nobody was going to help me because everyone knew was, 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 what was going on, and nobody was going to do anything. And he told me not to tell my mom because if I say something, things were going to get worse. Uh, when my mom came, she knew that something was not okay, because he was still at home, and he wasn't supposed to be, at, to be there. So she asked me, and I told her. Um, and she went to the room, and they started fighting and screaming. And when she came out, uh, her, lip was, her lip was cut, her face was swollen, and she had already a purple eye. And she just looked at me like, I never forgot her face, because it was like a, I feel sorry for you, but also, this is your fault, too. And... See, uh, 
and just things just got really bad from that. So I don't know if, uh, this is the part that I don't remember if going to Magdalena happened first or this happened first, I don't remember, but it happened. Um, and just things got worse from there. Um, it, it was every day that he could abuse me, he will do it at any moment. He will find ways to be alone with me. And my mom knew, and they will fight, and I will tell, and she will end up more bruised, more worse, worse uh, as, as the time went. The more I tell, the worse she got. And I just, at some point, we just, I didn't say anything, and she didn't say anything. She knew what was going on. She saw him doing things to me, and she just kept quiet. I think we both got into survival mode, I guess, where this is life, and this is what's going to happen every day. Um, so I didn't say anything anymore. Um, going back before my dad finally gave up on trying to get his family back, uh, he got my sisters and I, and he said, I'm going to take you to a place where you will never leave. You, 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 you will stay there. And I was like, where are we going? He's like, I'm going to take you to church. So he took us to the Baptist, Baptist church. And yeah, I never left the church. I stayed there. Uh, we were allowed to go every Sunday to church. And um, that was our only peaceful time, I guess, once a week for a few hours just to go to church and learn about God. Um, and for me, even when I did not understand what God is in control really meant, I started to believe they will, tell, they will say that God is in control of your situation and whatever you're going through, he, he, he knows what's going and, and, and he's going to get you through it and he's going to help you and all this stuff. And I just started to believe it. Um, even when I could not see anything changing, I, I still believe that God was in control. Uh, so when I was 10 years old, I, um, I prayed to God and I said, I have no idea why a loving God is allowing this to happen. But they told me that you, have to, that you have control over things, so I believe it. So I want you to take control over this. And I'm like, but please don't let him touch my sisters. And he, he never touched my sisters. He, all the sexual abuse was towards me. Um, and um, uh, I do not want to get too graphic, um, but in Mexico, in, in the rural areas, there is this belief of the dad needs, has the duty to take the daughter's virginity when they turn 15 years old. So he was doing horrible things to me, but not finishing the act, I guess, because um, he was waiting for me to turn 15 to do what any good father will do, I, I guess. Um, so that was my, my fear that he will do something worse than already he was doing to me when I turned 15. Um, but yeah, that was life for us. He was very physically, physical, he was physically abusing my mom and my sisters. He was emotionally abusing me, sexually abusing me. He manipulated me into saying that, telling me that if I say something, he was going to kill my sisters and my mom, and I was going to take my mom's place. And we had an outhouse because where we live, it was very poor. So there was no, like, electricity. or And if you have electricity, the neighbors will steal it from you with a cable, you know. Um, we didn't have, like, a plumbing system or something. So we had an outhouse. And he will tell me, if you tell someone in the church that what is going on here, I'm going to kill them in front of you, and I'm going to throw them there, and nobody will find their bodies. So obviously, at 10 years old, I was very scared because I knew what he was capable of capable of doing, so I didn't say anything. Um, we also did not went to school uh, because we didn't have papers to prove that we exist, I guess. Um, uh, so we were, I started working before I was nine years old, uh, cleaning houses or helping someone just to get some money. Uh, and at some point I will use a change work for food because he will only work Mondays and the next day he got laid or he got sick or blah, 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 and he will not go to work. So we were lucky to have food, to have two meals a day. Uh, we, were, we went three days without food at all. And on the weekends, 
his mom will take us to the middle class neighborhoods so we can dig in the trash for like the aluminum can, the soda cans, so we can sell them and get money. Or we will all go behind the supermarket to the dumpster and just dig uh, for the not pretty vegetables that were not rotten, but you know, you don't get the bananas with the black stains. Uh, so we will get that and just take it home and eat. And yeah, that was life. Um, my mom, uh, so like I, I mentioned before, I had, my mom had eight daughters, um, six da five daughters with my, my dad. And um, um, when we finally were allowed to go to school, even with uh, the, the, uh, the papers, um, one day we came from school and we have a house, but it was, it was just like a big, a big rectangle, and it was three beds, a table, and maybe a stove, I don't remember. Uh, but this day, um, my mom left a metal bucket in the house with fire, and she, she left like a, not like a grill top, but more like, like a metal rack and a big pot of something that was boiling in there. I don't know what it was, something was boiling. And my little sister, who was just starting to walk, uh, she just kept coming to us. And so she had to walk from the bed, the bucket with fire, and us. And she kept coming, and I kept taking her back, and back and forth, back and forth. And at some point, I got annoyed that I pushed her a little bit, and whatever was on the bucket, just, and on the pot, just fell on her body, just started burning her skin. Um, so we yelled for my mom, because we were alone again, and they took her to the hospital. I remember seeing just this side of her body just bubbling. And she was taken to the hospital and we, we, ne we never saw her again. We don't know what happened to her. There was no funeral, nothing. We don't know if she died on the way. Like, I have no idea. I told a friend once and she was like, did she die? I'm like, I don't know. She's like, people get born all that time and they survive. I'm like, I don't know. We, we don't know what happened to her. Um, and then not even a year later, um, my sister, who is 14 months younger than me, she was like a second mom to her baby sister. So one morning she went to feed her now youngest sister, and her stepfather told her to come back later. Again, it was in the summer. And she, ca she came out of the room, and when she went back about an hour or so later, she found her sister wrapped in a blanket dead. So she started screaming, he killed her, he killed her. And... Um, she was taken, and we say that, she, that he killed her because it was summer. My mom said that she had pneumonia, but my sister, but we know that she was not sick. She found her on a blanket wrapped all the way to her nose, so she suffocated or something. Uh, so that was very traumatic for my sister, finding her baby dead. Um, but I cannot ask my mom what exactly happened because she doesn't talk about it. Um, so we, we did have a funeral for her. Um, but yeah, if you ask my sisters and myself, we said that he killed her. If you ask my mom, she said that she died from pneumonia. So I don't know what happened. Um, uh, my mom went to have two daughters with him too. And um, yeah, it just, life was like that. No food, abuse all the time, and no education. Um, I think I'm going to take... It's not, gonna, it's not going to be as, as longer as I, as I expected. Um, in 2005, in the beginning of the summer, my sisters and I decided that we wanted to run away because we had enough. Um, it was my idea because in the next state, my favorite group was playing and I wanted to go see them. So we were like, you know what, we're just going to run away. And we talked to a friend, and he's like, oh, you know what, we're heading that way too. We, we'll just give you a ride. I'm like, all right, we will pack and we're going to go. And that night we were like, if we go in the morning, he will do something to my mom because he will think that my mom planned this whole thing to try to get help. We're like, and he might kill her. He might kill his daughters and all this stuff. So we decided not to do it. So we stay home, and I listen on the radio to my favorite group. Um, and about a week later, he got really dark. There was something not right about him. I could see it. His eyes just 
there was this evil on his face when you saw him. You could tell something was not right with him. I don't remember him eating at all for a week, but he was using a lot of drugs. Um, and for some reason, he was, he got an ax and he was just making a sharp and sharp every day. That's what he will do. And he will just look at my mom and just make the ax more sharp. And, I and he will look at me with a smirk and he will look at my mom and the face you would completely change. And I was like, something bad is going to happen. And I don't know what it is. I don't know when it's happening. But I could, I could just feel it. Um, he, um, um, the following Sunday, he did not allow us to go to church. And that was weird because he always was like, oh, just, just go to church and just, just go. And that Sunday, he was like, you guys are not going anywhere. I'm like, okay. Um, in the house, when, when you walk into our house, there was a bed, a table, and a stove. And he, he had a pile of wood. He was getting a pile of wood. And we were like, we don't need wood. And it's summer. Like, why does he need all this stuff that he's preparing? He was taking a pallet apart with, and keeping the, keeping the nails on them. So he was making a big pile of them and the ax. Um, and that Sunday, we were invited to a, a birthday party. And we had to walk to the birthday party about 30 minutes walk. Um, it's not, it's not a lot in Mexico, but it is a lot. Um, and it rained a lot that, that day. So my mom had to come back to the house and get jackets for his daughters because it was getting cold. Not for us. It was all for his daughters. And he got really mad at the party, saying that my mom was this and that, and I'm not going to say it. <laughs> um, and he was just very, very upset. And so when she came back, she, he started accusing her of sleeping with his brother, and that's why my, his daughter was too white, which she's more white than, I mean, it's not like I'm white, but she's, she's more, she doesn't look like us. Um, so he starts saying that that was not his daughter, and that's why he was trying to kill her, and that's what he did. For many years, he tried to kill his own daughter, just trying to suffocate her many times, because it was not his daughter. He swore it's not his daughter. Um, so that night, he just was very upset, and we just started walking back home. We walked as fast as we could, and my sister were like, he's going to hit my mom. He's going to hit my mom. Um, and as soon as we got home, um, we had a dirt, flo a dirt floor too. So he, as soon as we got home, he just threw her in and started kicking her, and just kicking her and kicking her and hitting her with his hands. And everyone started to cry. We didn't have any time to do anything at all. No time to take my sisters away, nothing. Um, uh, so that, this went on for, I think we got home around 11.30 or 12, and this went gone all night. And at some point he got tired of using his hands, so he got the, the pellets with, a, with a, the, the nail part and started hitting my mom with them. And my mom just started screaming to stop, and my sisters were crying, and I was just there not moving at all. My body just froze, and I didn't do absolutely anything. And I honestly, I do, I do regret sometimes that I did not shelter my sisters from what they saw, because they shouldn't have seen what they saw. They were three and four years old. I was 12, then was 11, 10, and 43 years old. Um, and I, sometimes I do wonder if it was better that they saw what it happened, and or if I will just put them in the other room and they will hear, hear everything. I, I, I don't know what's worse, if seeing it or just hearing and putting these pictures in your head. You know, I, I don't know what was worse. Um, um, so he started hitting her with the pieces of pellets and just my mom, as the hours went on, you could not even recognize her, her face anymore. It was busted lip, swollen eyes, blood all over her face. Um, and I didn't do anything. Um, the, the moment that he grabbed the axe, just something clicked on my head. And I'm like, he's going to kill her. So I just told him, like, stop. That's, that's enough. And I was, everyone was crying, but I was, because my mind was just not there. I was not crying. And I was really calm. And I was like, that's enough. And he did hit my mom right here on the leg with the, uh, not a sharp side of the axe, but with the other side, but that was enough to, 
uh, leave a big mark on her leg. I don't know if it was broken or not. I think she had a couple of broken ribs and a lung that was damaged for all the pain. And after he dropped the ax, he threw my mom on the bed and he just lay down on the, on the floor and he was quiet for a while. And I think maybe an hour later or so, he grabbed, he grabbed my mom by the hair and started telling her names and dropped her down. So like the bed was this high and he just threw her down on the floor and my mom did not make a sound. She did not move, nothing. And that's when I was like, she's dead. And I, everyone, I took my sisters, Brianda and I, my other sister, we took everyone to the other room because we thought my mom was dead. And he thought my mom was dead. And he was crying and asking for forgiveness and saying that he said, I love you and I don't want to live without you. What am I going to do without you? And he, got a da he had a dagger saying that he was going to kill himself and all of this. And I, I just I had enough of everything. I went outside and I started crying. I think this was probably the second time that I prayed to God. Um, and I was selfish praying. I was just saying, God, you don't need my mom. I'm like, Isn't it, it, just please don't take her. What, what are you going to do with her? I'm like, we need my mom. I need my mom. And I'm like, you know what he's going to do to me if you take her away. And I was like, just, just please, not yet. And I just remember looking at the stars, and it was a beautiful night outside. It was Everything was just quiet. And I was just there crying and begging God not to take my, my mom away. And this breeze just came from this side and then just wrapped me around. And I just felt so much peace. I felt like God was wrapping me around and telling me that it was going to be okay. And this just peace just came over me and I was like, okay. She's not dead, I guess. Uh, like, I, I guess that's what I thought. I don't know. So I went back inside, and we found perfume or alcohol. I don't remember. And we put, over, put it on my mom's nose, and she was not waking up at all. Uh, so we keep just putting more and more and more until she finally woke up. And he took my mom to the room, and he did not let us see my mom for, like, two days. Um, and uh, by Wednesday... My mom could walk just a little bit, and she told Brianda, my sister, because she was the fast runner, to go down to the, to the neighbors and ask them to use their phone so she could call her mom, my, my maternal grandmother, to come and get us, but nobody answered the phone. And then she's like, well, call your grandfather, my, my dad's dad, and he's like, oh, he's in jail in the U.S. for crossing drugs. And we're like... There is no hope for us at all. Like, the only people that could save us is, are, are not here. And when Brianda came back home, a taxi pulled from the back of the house because we live on a hill, so you have to go around to go to our house. And it was my dad. He was just, he got gotten out of jail. He was a storyteller. So he said that he crossed drugs, he crossed cocaine on a... Uh, like a dump truck or like a pipe, something like that, like a, a, those cars that take water on pipes. I don't know if it's right or not. But he, according to him, that car was full of cocaine. And so the U.S. had been in jail for like five years, and they let him go after that. I don't know if it's true or not. Um, but he saw my mom, and he got really mad. He's like, I'm going to kill this son of the devil, because that's what he called him, the son of the devil. Um, and I'm going to kill him, and he should have done this to you, and all this stuff. And my mom was like, just, just let's go. But he was gone with, my, with one of his daughters to the other side of, that, of the place. Um, so the police came, and they had to take us and see where he was. And they were trying to tell my mom to press charges, because my mom could, it, it was Wednesday, and my mom could barely walk. You, you, you could barely see her face. She, it was really, really swollen. Um, this eye was closed and purple over the place. It was just horrible to see. Um, and my mom was like, I don't want to do anything. I just want my daughter back, and I just want to get out of here. So 
They're like, well, we cannot do anything about it. Um, so they just asked him to give my mom or sister, and he, did, he didn't even fight or anything. He was like, oh, just, okay, go. Um, so my dad paid the taxi driver to take us to Magdalena, which is only like an hour and a half south. And um, so that's what we did. We ended up at my, we arrived in Magdalena the same day. Uh, we ended up in m my mom's parents' house uh, for a few months. We were there, and my grandmother was very religious, so she said that her condition for us to, to be there is for us, that we have to go to the, the Catholic church and do all the process to become a good Catholic person, and I, we did all of this, that, the first communion and all, and all that stuff, but in my heart, I'm like, I'm, I don't belong to this church. I am a Christian, and I just did it to please her, um, but a few months after being there, like probably six months later, um, something happened to my sisters that is not my, my story to tell, is, is their part, so I'm not going to say it, uh, so we ended up moving to uh, 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 other side of the town, um, where we became friends with a local, um, what you would call junkies, I guess. Um, they were good kids, just not good examples around. Um, and my dad was uh, still living on this idea that he was going to get his family back. Um, he wanted all his family back, and he wanted to live happily ever after, and my mom was like, I'm not even going to do that. And we couldn't love someone that we didn't know. So there was no love to share. I, he tried, and we tried, but there was... There was no connection in there. So after a year, he finally gave up, and he's like, I'm not going to support you anymore. You, your daughters don't love me. You don't love me. See how you deal with them. Um, so my grandfather, his dad, another weird man, told my mom, take, take the cross to CVE, and you can, uh, uh, you can come and live with me. Be, 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 be my wife. My mom was like, I'm not doing that. Uh, <laughs> So, so we went to CVE, and we knew CVE because when I was little, like in 1992 or something, we used to live at CVE before it was CVE. Uh, my grandfather was the, like, the housekeeper of the place uh, who was owned by a Christian musician or something. So we, knew, so we knew CVE, but it was very ugly when we were little, and it was beautiful when we got there in 2006, um, again in the summer. Um, uh, so, so we got at CVE, and my mom and Bill Sheik went to the office, and they had a long conversation that we don't know what they talk about. Um, and I don't know how many of you have been to CVE when there were kids there, but Yanelli, I don't know if anyone ever met Yanelli, very short girl, super friendly. She introduced us to everyone, and she was so happy, and I was, I was just so confused by all this joy and happiness in that place. I, I did not understand anything. Um, I was 14 when, when we got there, and that same day we had dinner with everyone. And to me, all this happiness was new. I was just like, well, all these kids are so happy, and all these Americans are so happy, and I'm like, this is so weird. And, <laughs> um, and Bill and Joan took us to their house, and I was just like, what are they trusting us? Like, what are they taking us to our house? We just met like three hours ago, and now they're opening their doors to our house. And I think Joan is uh, watching right now, so she didn't know that I thought that they were weird for doing that. Um, but <laughs> uh, they took us to their house, and they, their kids were super nice to us. And, and there was a war team from Kansas, um, and they built a really small house for us. Very, very small. It was... Uh, a room for a bunk bed, a room for a stove, and a bathroom, and that was it. So it was my mom with six daughters there living. Um, and we started going to, to, uh, to church. They will pick us up and take us to church, and, um, and I just like it. I love everything that I saw at CV. I saw the peace. I saw the friendship. I saw everything that I did not know, and I wanted it. Um, that was my ambition. Uh, that's what I wanted. My sisters wanted to marry a rich dude, and have a lot of money, and they have a lot of kids, but not enough money. Um, my idea was i going to join, either I become a nun or I join the military, because I did not want to get married with 
every reason. Um, but I also wanted what they had that I did not know what it was. Um, so in March 2007, I told Joan that I wanted to get baptized. And she's like, well, don't tell me. Go and talk to Bill. I'm like, well, I didn't know. So, <laughs> so I went and talked to Bill, and I told him, I already gave my life to Christ when I was 10 years old, but I have learned more now that I'm here, and I want to get baptized. Um, so we did, I did all the process to become a member. He asked me about my life and my sins, and I told him a little bit, but not the sexual abuse, because that was holding me back a lot. Like, I will go nights hearing his voice and telling me, you belong to me, and I'm going to come and I'm going to get you because you are mine. And I could not break from that until uh, one day after church. Joan got to know me so well that she knew when I was just messing up with my hands, she knows something was wrong. And she's like, what's going on? I'm like, oh, nothing. She's like, why don't you walk to the library, go to the book, that, that, that will, we can talk later. I was like, okay. And on, it, it, it's, it's a two-minute walk from the dining room at CB to the library that we used to have. And I was, I keep hearing his voice, and he was telling me, you are mine. Nobody's going to love you the way I love you. Every man is going to use you. They're going to use your body because you're mine. And I, he, his voice was just right on my head, and I'm like, I couldn't stop it. So I got to the library, and I just was crying. And um, Carissa was there, um, our and Twyla's daughter. And she freaked me out. She's like, are you okay? I'm like, I'm like, no. And we talk, and she was the first person that I told her about my sexual abuse. And she asked my permission to talk to the other ladies about it so they could help me out. And I was like, okay, that's fine. And they came, and they talked to me, and they said, like, we do don't know how it feels, but we love you, and we're here to talk if you want to talk to us. So that was a little bit of the last chain holding me down, I guess, before I became a member. Uh, I got baptized in the same year in 2007, in November, um, um, when a group from Denver was there. So a few people that come here from church, I met, they were at my baptism, too. Um, and I... Uh, just Bill and John just became my family. They were my biggest support. I, they were there when I needed them. John became like a second mom, and I never really knew what a real father was. I did not have an example of what a godly dad was. And Bill just filled that hole in my heart, I guess, that I needed a dad. And I would just run to their house, and their door was always open to me. And something that I wanted to hear from my mom was to, I wanted to hear her say that I am so proud of you because um, I had this, jo this joke right here that says that I am very smart in Spanish, which I am. I, <laughs> I had like my report cards were filled with A pluses and A pluses and I will do a lot of poetry recital and I will go to these competitions, math stuff and all these papers that at some point don't mean anything, but when you're a kid and you're getting an A and getting these rewards for doing well, I just wanted to hear my mom say, I'm proud of you. And I had all, I was like, hey, mom, the, the governor sent a letter saying that you should be proud of me for my accomplishments. And she was like, okay. And all I wanted was her approval, and I never got it. And Joan, will, will, she will brag to everyone, Elizabeth got an A+. Plus. Elizabeth got this, Elizabeth got that, and I am so proud of you, Elizabeth. And I was just like, thank you. But I was like, this is not what I want. I want to hear it from my mom. I want my mom to tell me that she's proud of me, and I never got it. I, I still haven't. Um, but just hearing it from Joan, it was like, I, I want to be like her sometime. I, why my mom cannot be? Why, why, why can I hear that from my mom? You know, all we want sometimes is our parents' approval for everything, and I did not get that. And sometimes it, when I go through my papers and I see all my letters from the governor saying, Marcela Martinez, be so proud of your daughter because she has accomplished so much, and she's one of the best students in the state, and she won this competition to go and meet the president of the country and all this stuff, and for her it didn't mean anything. Um, I think the only times that she told me that she was proud of me was when she got my check from my scholarship because I got a lot of money from being a smarty pants. Um, <laughs> so that's when I saw a smile on her 
because of the stinking money. Um, and for Bill and John, that didn't matter. What it mattered is what I wanted and what I needed, and it was love and compassion, I guess. Um, and after, when I was going to graduate from college, I mean from high school, I was going to join the military because even as a member, I still had the idea that I'm not going to get married. I'm going to join the military, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go and serve my country. Um, but um, I was offered a job as a teacher uh, for a new school that they wanted to open. So I was like, all right, I guess I'm going to do that. So I guess I did not want to join the military that bad. Um, so uh, me, uh, myself and other four people opened the school at CV the first year. Carissa was there, me, uh, Todd Stoller from Princeville, I think, and Pau and Gio, who now are members. I don't know if, I don't know if you guys know them, um, and another lady. Um, so we started a school, and I was doing my last year of high school, with, which also was trade school. So I was doing high school and, to, and also to be an assistant accountant. So that was a lot of stuff. And teaching in the mornings or in the afternoons, it didn't matter. Um, and finally, when I, well, I moved to CBE too. And so I, I was just living there, living there. And um, when I was 19, I just realized that I wasn't really free from my past. So I talked to Carissa, and she was like, have you ever talked to God and asked him where he was when you were suffering? I'm like, well, I know he saw everything. It's like, but you, it's like, she told me, you need to talk to God and ask him where he was, and then you need to forgive your stepfather. And I was like, all right. I did not hate him. I never did. I never, I always wondered why he did what he did. Because well, when he will abuse me, he will after then cry and ask for, for, for forgiveness because he said that he didn't know what he was doing that and he couldn't stop. And I was like, yeah, I forgive you. But it was the cycle of abuse and forgiveness, abuse and forgiveness. And I don't think he was truly repentant of that. So at around 19, I, I told him through the wind, I forgive you. Um, I don't know where you are. You will never hear from me. I will never hear from you, but I forgive you. And so I did that, um, and I was better. The win for me has always been special because I feel that's the way of God talking to me. Um, and when I was on my lowest points, I would always feel the breeze wrapping me around, and I was like, there, there is God listening to my cries again. Um, but I also, I don't think I still understood God's love for me yet. I couldn't really understand how someone could love someone like me, so dirty in the inside. Even when my sins are already washed away and clean, there is still that us that we don't feel clean. And uh, in 2014, that changed because I met Dustin. Um, and he was there with the ISU group. Um, and we in, he introduced himself the night before he... Uh, he, they, they came back, and after he was here over the weekend, I went to my computer and I saw uh, he will deny this, but he sent me a friend request on Facebook, not the other way around. Um, <laughs> and uh, he's right over there with the kids. <laughs> and I just had this voice tell me, you got to talk to him. And I'm like, I am not going to talk to him. And I was just fighting this voice telling me, just go and talk to him, say, hi, thank you for coming or whatever. And I was like, I'm not going to do that. And I finally said, like, hi, thank you for coming this week. And I asked him, what was the name of that song that he played on the guitar? And it was 10,000 Reasons. I don't know what I asked that, but I asked. And we uh, became friends um, like that. And we just talk a lot on Facebook. And by like May, he told me that he was feeling that God was telling him that he needed to marry me. And I was like, uh, nope. That's, <laughs> I am not doing that. Um, I, don't, I, I don't want that. And he knew that he not wanted to get married. And he knew um, my past. Um, and, but that night when he told me that he was feeling that way um, and he did not know what to do, I, I just cried a lot because I was like, Why? Out of, he can just go and find an American girl over there that is pure and easy to handle than me. Like, why he would want to marry me? And I just, has this, I just had this feeling that, because that's how much I love you. I don't care who you, I don't care what happened to you, you know. I, 
I just love you the way you are. And I guess that's how I understood God, God's pure love for, for, for me, that he didn't care about my past because it was nothing that happened. It was my fault. Um, so he was advised by Mark not to talk to me and just pray about it because we talk a lot. Um, I don't know if that's part of the institution or not. Um, so we weren't allowed to talk for a month, and then he sent a proposal, uh, which I, I was not expecting, and you know how ISIS goes. <laughs> um, so Mike Lehman went to uh, um, CVE for a wedding, and we were going to play frisbee, and he told me, uh, so I have, an, I have news for you. And I was like, yeah. Like, Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> so just playing frisbee was so uncomfortable. Uh, and then after that, we talked, and I told him, I'm like, Mike, years ago, I prayed to God that if he wanted me to get married, I wanted a guy to tell me. I didn't I wanted to be surprised by someone random telling me that he wanted to marry me because I would not know who that was. I'm like, and I know that's not how you guys, how you guys do things, but that's what I pray for, and I guess it's him. Uh, so I prayed some more, and I did some fasting because I did not know that's an in-person. Uh, talking on social media is not the same as seeing someone in face, you know? We can be sweethearts on social media. Um, <laughs> so uh, I said yes about two months later. Um, and, well, I am here now. Um, and Marsha wanted me to talk more about how CVE, um, the impact that CVE had in my life. And I did it before for Harvard School um, when they asked me the impact of CVE in the people in Magdalena. And I guess, um, well, it was, a good, uh, it was good, I guess I'm here, um, is uh, everyone that, that, if you went to CBE 10 years ago, you saw God's work in everyone's life, in the kids, in the, in the staff, in people that came to church. Um, I mean, it has changed a lot. We went there last summer, and it was just, I'm glad I got there when I got there, because uh, it, it, it was just not the same anymore. Um, I think the biggest in, impact in my life was Bill and Joan, their, their love. I mean, I never had a dad, like I said before, a, a real dad. And for the past 16 years, I got to know, I got to have a dad. I, had, I got to share a dad with um, like 19 kids, I think. That's how many they have. <laughs> with, with all the adopted kids and their, their own kids. Um, and they include me and other people in their lives too. I mean... They're like Abraham and Sarah. They have tons of kids, all and young. Um, but I got to experience a, 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 a true dad. Um, and, yeah, he passed away last April. And that was hard to lose a dad that you only have for 15 years. You know, it's, it was hard. And I did cry to God. And I'm like, this, he doesn't deserve this. I'm like, why are you doing this to him? That God is man I know, and you're taking him away. It, it, it's not fair. But you, if you are friends with, if you were friends with him on Facebook, you saw his faith. And he was just trusting in God through everything. And yeah, his, him and John were the biggest impact in my life while at CVE. I mean, CVE did wonderful things for me and my family, especially more for me. And I got hold of it, and I didn't want it to let go, and I'm glad I never did. I, they opened uh, their arms to us, and I accepted. I wish my family would have done it, but they did not. They are. Um, I think it's because I decided to trust in God that I'm able to move on. Well, my, my sisters have not. They are still holding into the past. And they're not able to move on. And I think I am just because I trusted in God's grace. And I just decided to believe that he was in control. And here I am now because of him. Um, and yeah, going back to Brother Andy's sermon, I think it was Mark or him that said at the end that we shouldn't see our enemies as enemies, but as, as potential children of God. I don't know what happened to him. I don't know if he ever found God. I Somehow, I hope he did, because I know he also has some bad stuff going on in his life as a kid. But I, like I said before, I never saw him as an enemy. I never hated him. 
I don't think I ever blamed him. I didn't ever blame my mom. Now as a mom, I think I know why she did what she did. I mean, what was she going to do with five daughters alone? You know, she had no support system. So her only safe spot it was, was living with him and just taking whatever was given to her. Um, she is married now. I used to call her the woman on the well because she had five husbands. She actually had, and none of them were her husbands. Uh, and she got married about three years after I got married, and I was so happy for her. She found a really, really good man, and he is very funny. Um, Dustin and I approve of him. Um, and he did tell me in Mexico, okay, Elizabeth, tell me the truth. Do you approve of me? Am I good enough? I'm like, yes, you are. So I don't want you going back to the U.S. and saying, oh, the bald guy, is he's so mean. And I was like, no, I, I, I approve of you. I, I approve. Um, so I, I'm just, I told us, and, well, I cannot call her that woman on that wall anymore because she's not. She found, I mean, not God yet, but she, found, she finally has peace, and I'm very happy for her. I mean, we both found, uh, we both found peace. We haven't talked about what happened because she will not talk about it, and I will not push her to talk about it. I don't like to live in the past. I, there is no point on talking about the past. I talk about my testimony here, um, not for you to feel bad for me because I don't want that, but it's just so you can see what God, what God can do when you know, we open our hearts to him and we let him come in. Um, I like questions, Isn't if anyone has questions. I can answer them. Hearing your story, and if there are any questions, I can I can field those now too. Uh, but it is a very powerful story about God. God's love finding you in the most terrible situation. And a verse came to me as you were talking, and I'm going to read that from Revelation. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And I don't know why, and on this side of heaven, we won't know why, and we won't see the full story of why this happened, but that you were able to find and believe that God does love you. And that moment when you were standing there and you felt that breeze come and got feeling God's peace that he's there and that he loves you is a testimony of God being there and that he really does love us. And that was really encouraging to me to hear that. So, um, Wayne, will you pray for us? Yeah. Let's rise and pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, our hearts have been touched again. How great thou art. Thou can see into the far reaches of the earth. We, we live in comfort and <clears throat> relative peace here. And Sure, some of us go through hard things, but nothing like Ellie has gone through. <clears throat> and we are so grateful, Lord, and thankful again that thou hast rescued her, even from the evil she was in and then granted peace and joy in her heart. We give thee praise and thanks. We know that you could see her wherever she was, and you can see all those who are abused at this time and are hurting across the earth, Lord. And you know everything. Wrap your arms around them and be a comfort to them wherever they are that they might learn to put their trust in you and find this peace and, and escape from the horrors that are with them. Bless the evening, Lord. May it move our hearts to be more thankful and appreciative again of what thou hast done for us. And we praise thee, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks again for coming. Next month, we're going to have a night about Israel. So we'll have some people talking about that went on the trip recently. And we'll have some Mediterranean food, little snacks prepared afterwards. So I heard Brent Wagenbach is going to get a lamb. No, there, there will be no lamb. So, uh, yeah, thank you again for coming.